get your uh, uh, Tom Brokaw here for uh, uh, Greatest Generation. It's a book, Greatest Generation book. Uh, I have Rooney's Window down in Main Street there filled up with uh, So with that out of the way, uh, I'd like to start out with a little story about three individuals. And these three individuals, they're with at least some crossover connections back to me with artifacts that were left from there. First one is about 40 plus le letters that were written back and forth between two lovers. Uh, the young lady was Jewish. And these letters were written between 1920 and 1924. And in it, the romance had blossomed, and uh, they were talking about getting married at some point in time. But he was a uh, student going for his doctoral degree in philosophy, struggling student. <coughs> he also wrote a couple of plays. One of them got to the stage, and only well, lasted three nights, and he was very discouraged. But anyways, these letters were numbered about 40 plus, and these letters actually saved her life and her family's. Because in 1924, this individual decided to join the Nazi party. And she was furious about it. She said, how could you join an organization that thrives itself on hating me, my family, everybody I know, everybody within my religion? And, you know, they broke off the relationship. But she kept the letters for some reason. And obviously, you know, probably just, you know, we all do. But they came in handy like 10 years later when he was at the pinnacle of his power. And she used these letters and she wrote off to him, saying that I have these letters, and that if you come after me, my family, or anybody I love, they're in a bank vault in Switzerland. But I have copies, and these copies will be disseminated to the world press, telling that you, Joseph Goebbels, and I were lovers. The next individual, oh, and I was at, trying to get these letters, but they came up for auction about 10 years ago. Uh, I dropped out of 10,000, and they went to like 13,000. <laughs> like, uh, but they had never surfaced. You know, that's a strange thing about these things. They just never surfaced. The next individual uh, grew up in a fairly privileged life form in Prussia, uh, kind of affluent. They weren't of the royal class, but they were just below, several steps below that class level. Uh, his father was a German minister in the uh, foreign service. And he eventually was sent to Uganda. And he was the governor of Uganda. Kind of an elderly gentleman. <clears throat> Mother was a little bit younger. And the distance kind of blended in. And eventually she took up with a, with, a, with, a, with a gentleman who had a baron title, but didn't have a bond to it because his last name was Epstein. So she came in with her two children, her two, two, two sons. One eventually went off to the uh, Prussian military academy. And when World War I broke out, he joined the infantry. And eventually he finished up in the German Air Force heading the famed Red Baron squadron after the Red Baron was killed, uh, receiving the Corps de the Blue Max, after 21 kills. Uh, he befriended a, a, another pilot who was Jewish by the name of Erhard Milch, who would later come into service when he was head of the Luftwaffe. This is Hermann Goering. Uh, in 1923, during the Munich push, October, uh, November 9th, 1923, in Munich, he received a ricochet wound to the groin area and was pulled into a house by his Jewish family who patched him up and got him, you know, put together and eventually got him out of the country into Sweden. Years later, when Hermann Goering came into power, he called his old friend Gerhard Milch and he made him an honorary Aryan. He also had him state that he was an illegitimate child because his mother was Jewish, his father wasn't. And he made him head section of the, one of the German Luftwaffe areas uh, of, of research. 
he eventually rose to the rank of field marshal. And people were kind of going after him and saying, why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? And, and Gray made, made, made his famous statement, I decide who should shoot. The elderly couple, he sent the Gestapo down that he had, sit, that he had put together, gave them express orders to find these people, make sure they are not harmed, make sure they can take all their possessions and bring them to Switzerland, get them out of the country as fast as you can. The next individual, his mother had cancer. She was dying of cancer. Uh, the family had a doctor, family doctor, who was Jewish. Upon her death, he went with the children to the gravesite, and he held the little boy's hand while they were burying his mother. In World War I, his commanding officer was Jewish, and he sent him on all these dangerous missions where he was gassed and had got shrapnel wounds and everything else. But he managed to write up all these orders where he was presented with the Iron Cross second class and the very rare Iron Cross first class. In 1923, after the failed Munich push, he was in Landsberg prison with an old friend of his from his World War I days by the name of Emil Maurice, who was of German, French, Jewish extraction. In the famous photograph of Emil, he's sitting there in the prison cells, because all the prison cells were connected and they all had, you know, arrangements, playing the mandolin. Emil's mother would come in with cakes and cookies and sweets and give these things to the guys. And uh, when they were released, uh, Emil with another individual uh, helped set up a protection squad called the Schriftstapel. The SS. Emil Maurice was half Jewish. He was party member number 39, co founder of the SS, SS member number two. Hitler tried for years to get him out and could. Hitler would not release him. Hitler would not do anything. He did have a big blow up when he dated Hitler's niece, but they patched that whole thing up, and during the war, Emil went into the Luftwaffe, flew fighter pilots, and died in the 1960s. And I was in my friend's office in New York State several years ago with a pile of stuff on the table. There was Emil Maurice's party badge. There was his SS badge. Uh, there were two volumes of Mein Kampf, because Mein Kampf originally came out two volumes with the, with the, the deluxe bind, bind, bound set. Autographed to not only to him, but to his mother who brought the cakes and cookies to the prison. Now you're asking yourself, why am I telling you these stories about this? These are three individuals of the top rank that created the Holocaust, and yet they had connections. And you sit and you're seeing yourself, you know, they didn't live in a vacuum. You know, they didn't hate Jews because they hated Jews for a reason that we can never understand. They had them within their own life. They had them within their, around them, surrounding them. And yet they were able to do this. You have to ask yourself, what was going through the minds of these people? You probably never heard any of these stories. You probably see them going, like, what? Yeah, it's the truth. It's the absolute truth. So, I began collecting this stuff as a boy. You'll see all these t stories and tales of soldiers and stuff coming back. And then my family and bringing all this stuff back and saying, here, kid, look at this. But the Holocaust happened in a small way at first. The Nazis had publications like Der Sturma, The Stormer. And this is from 1936. The publication was first came out in 1922 or 23 and lasted until February of 1945. And in it, as always, under the mask head down here, is the Jew is our misfortune on every paper that came out. Uh, this one happens to be talking about um, the Jews in crucifixion, who crucified Jesus and who was responsible, and all this sort of stuff. Here. Great. You know, this is, this is, this is fodder for the, for the masses. And of course, they had cartoons on it. It was just a, a complete droll 
on, on society. But this was a very popular paper at that time. Uh, Goebbels had his own called, uh, oh God, I can't even think of it right now, uh, but he had his own paper. And uh, I have copies of it at home, I don't have any right here. Another Dushirva, for instance, right here. But this is the stuff that came out from the public. This is what the public saw daily. Posters. Um, but it was done in an innocuous fashion. I'm not going to use that for this. I'll uh, come up with something else. This is called the House Book for the German Families. This is a book that most housewives in Germany would have. And in it was advertisements for how to set up a perfect German home. There would be ads in here. Uh, bassinet ads in the back here, you know, for children and everything else. Uh, there'd be tips on how to set up the most perfect home, and there'd be recipes in here for schnitzel and strudel and everything marvelous that you could ever want to eat in Germany. And in the middle of the book is the Nuremberg Clause. Six or seven pages of nothing but who is a Jew and how is that person a Jew and, and everything else, and how much of a percentage of a Jew is this person. This is basically Otto Hitler meets, meets Betty Crocker. But this is how it was fed to the public in a very simple, forthright manner. Deception at its grandest level. Other books and titlements here is, uh, oh, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was first published in Russia by a member of uh, Nicholas II's uh, secret security staff. And this is, this is actually the book that kicked off everything back in 19, or 1898 and in 97 it came out, it came out of it, and was republished by the Nazis years later and widespread throughout the whole uh, right now as truth, but none of it was. It was all made up, completely made up. But I like to talk about the first Holocaust. What else the first Holocaust? Yeah, there was, there was one before that. It was kind of a trial. And I happen to have something here that fits into that. All of us here are old enough to remember film strips, right? Because when I talk to people today, mostly kids, they go, what? Well, this is a film strip. This is from the Hitler Youth. And this film strip here, is entitled, Life, a Becoming of Life. It talks about the mentally handicapped and challenged and what to do with them. And what the Nazis did with them was basically killed them off. From 1938, 39, somewhere in there, up until about 1941, 42. Actually, they, they said the program called T4, Tear Garden 4, was where it was originally started from, uh, is where it started. And, but this little film strip, was shown to kids, and it showed mentally handicapped people in most challenging predicaments, shot in the worst light possible. They, 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 would, they, would, they would shoot light from underneath the person to give them this more horrific, terrifying effect. So that you would see this and go, oh my God, look at these people, they're, 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 they're criminals, they're, 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 we have to do something. But this was a little film strip that was shown to kids to basically go back home and to, uh, Say, you know, Uncle Charlie, his cheese slipped off, and we have to do something about it. So, this was the mini Holocaust. And uh, it's an interesting thing. I, 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 would love to, I would love to have it run uh, at some point in time. I would love to have it turned into a film and uh, utilized because uh, I don't think any, most people have ever seen anything like this. It's just a you know, real gut-wrenching piece, you know, piece of information that uh, somehow needs to be out there. The Nazis were very keen on the media. Here's a uh, broadside for the, their most insidious movie, Unisus. Uh, this was a movie based on a historical fact 
sprinkled with Nazi ideology. Judas Oppenheimer was a uh, minister for a German prince back in the 18th century, and yes, he did deceive the prince, and yes, he was tried and hung. But the Nazis took it a step further, and they added all kinds of other little intrigue into it. And this movie that was produced was uh, basically the movie that was told by every member of the SS, you have to see this movie. It is required, it is a total requirement. Uh, you must see this movie. And that was the movie that pretty much transcended everything. It showed, you know, what people wanted to see, what they wanted to believe, and they ate it up. Other things were cards, postcards. I have here a series of postcards. Several years ago, I was involved with the former Hectipa Center in Springfield. Um, I loaned them about 68 items out of the collection and propelled them to a national level museum. And when they closed about 10 years ago, I got all my stuff back and some of the stuff was mounted. But this was a series of postcards. They went through a stack of my collection, of my collection, and they picked out, you know, these uh, two, three, five postcards here. Um, one of which was not German. It was this one here, showing Hitler castigating uh, Einstein out. You know, he's pointing out, you know, get out of my country. That was not done by the Nazis. This one I later found out was done by an American of Jewish extraction. He was living in New York City. And he's trying to show Americans how Jews were being treated in Germany in the early 30s. Unfortunately, the original to this art piece was destroyed by the American German Bund. They broke into a studio and they wrecked the painting. But the rest of it, from uh, the eternal Jew to unmasking Bol Bolshevism to this way to Palestine, uh, the other cards were basically cards that you could go and buy at kiosk stands or all throughout Germany, you know, selling postcards, picture postcards of any national shrine or temple or whatever. In, in a town, they would have these cards alongside it, as the general public could go out and purchase. Then with the Nuremberg Laws, they started out restricting people, their movements. You couldn't work in your profession. Uh, I have signs uh, for that. Uh, uh, there was one I had for a dentist, I believe he, he was. And it was, uh, he had to post this on his uh, window saying that he was a Jew and he had a photograph of him. And whether you could trick, do, you know, get your teeth fixed at him or not, you know, it's up to you. But he's a Jew, so you know, don't do it. Uh, Signs like this, Jews are forbidden from using the park benches. You couldn't own a dog. You couldn't go out after a certain time. I mean, this thing ramped up for several years. And I always like to talk about the last German law that came in during this time period, which came in December 25th of 1939. No Jew could own, make, or bake gingerbread. I mean, it's like, what? But this was Christmas. This was the Nazis. And they just, they, they just made it horrible and terrible. They, they, they wanted you to leave Germany. They, 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 made, they made this thing, you know, before the gas chambers and the ovens all started, this is what they did. They tried to push you out any way they could. They tried to move you out any way you could. And then they made it impossible for you to move. Uh, German travel, this is, this is a uh, German passport, Rice passport individual who lucky enough got out of Germany. But if you had to leave Germany, you had to pay not only this year's taxes, but next year's taxes. You had to pay two years of taxes before you leave Germany. Uh, you could only bring, I think it was, 2,500 right marks out of the nation. The rest of the stuff you had to sell, you had to sell your house at a fraction of its cost, you had to sell it, you know, whatever it is inside, or Stuff that you would own, and stuff that would be in your family, but you could only take out 25 Reichsmark, 2,500 Reichsmarks. And that was it. But this was the item that you had to have. You also had to have a document, you had to prove it who you were. And this was the typical Ausweis identification card. 
Uh, every male, every child above the age of every child above the age of 16 had to have one of these cards, and had a J in the front cover and a J in the inside cover. And here's a little story. Who asked to put the J on the cover? Anybody? Ready? Switzerland. Switzerland told Nazi Germany, "Hey, make it easy for us. Identify these people beforehand, so we know who's coming in." And I said, okay, what do you want to do? Put a J on the damn cover. Put a J on the cover, put a J on the inside cover, but give us a heads up. They're Switzerland. Not the Nazis. Any questions so far? Why did they do that? I mean, why did that country do that? I don't understand. I know, I know, but this 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 is Nazi Germany started the whole ball rolling. <clears throat> And they figured, okay, if it's good enough in Germany, it should be good enough for us. Of course, they didn't follow through with, you know, with, with that, that. They just, they just, they just did that little thing, that little twist. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. But it carried on. Um, I have another identification card from a, from, a, from, a, from a lady in France. This is after France fell in 1940. But this was her regular, everyday identification card. And most people in Europe have to have an identification card on. And it's all stamped. Well, she had to go to the local police station to get the word Juif, French for Jew, stamped above her photo. This is after they have taken over? 1940, yeah. Yeah, 1940. And then we all worked to know about the famous star. The star didn't come into to, to, to vogue until 1939 in Germany. It was, it was you know, after the invasion of Poland, basically. And uh, I got the collection of them here, but this is the one here. This is a brochure, and this is an un un unfashioned star, it's cut off the strip. But it says, when you see this, this is the enemy. And th th this actually folds out and tells you everything you need to know about the Jew. You know, in the Nazi mind. And these here are the stars, the various ones that I have so far. Uh, you, this is a typical German one. This is Belgium, the Netherlands, France, and this is Bulgaria. There's a little star here, button, right here. Interesting piece about this. These are all large, but this here is very small and could easily slip under your collar and you wouldn't know anything. Why? The king of Bulgaria, who was an ally of Hitler, told Hitler point blank. I will at least comply with your regulations about my Jews having to wear a star. There were about 75,000 of them, Bulgarian Jews in Bulgaria. But you can't have any of them. If you come to collect it, you can't have them. So, uh, that's kind of considered like the rarest one out there. Because he would not give up his Jewish citizens. These are my, these are my people. I am their king, you can't have them. But I will at least will comply with your regulations. But he made it so tiny that it was innocuous. It just, you know, it didn't stand up like the others. Because in some places you had to have a star on your left shoulder and your left shoulder, or in some places front and back. There was no regulation anywhere on any of the stuff. It was all whimsical. Any questions so far? Yes. I was curious when you held up the last thing on the corner of the table there, the um, brochure that yeah. said Van der Dieses, whatever. Yeah. Um, so what were they saying? Like what what was essential to know? Well, you, you had to know that you know the stereotype, the stereotypes that they came up with. You know, the, the long nose, the beady eyes, and all this sort of stuff that you know that you know. I mean, it really doesn't mean anything. I mean, but that was pretty much the propaganda that they forced upon their own people. You got to keep the drum beat. You got to keep the people going. I mean, I, unfortunately, I didn't bring any of my posters over. We have a lot of posters uh, in the collection. And you look at them and you go, what were you thinking? You know, what were you people thinking of this whole stuff? You know, there's a famous one that I have, it's in French. 
and it shows this stereotypical type of Jewish male coming through a curtain of the American flag, the Soviet flag, the British flag, the French flag, and all these, you know, before him, he's coming, he's coming through his drapery flags. And the wording translates, behind everything is the Jew. So behind all the facade, behind all the great thing of all these countries, the Jew is the major problem. We must root these people out. We must find them. You know, I, <clears throat> I do know someone that was, their mother mm -hmm. was in, uh, when she was 14, 15, was in one of those camps in mm -hmm. Austria learning to be a good Nazi. Mm -hmm. And she died in her 90s, still hating to the core the Jewish people. Honest to God, I, you would hear her talking, you'd have to tell her to be quiet yeah. or just leave the rest. She got older, you know, just ignore her because there was no change. But I mean, until she died, I mean, she lived in this country for many, many years. And it was and just, it, I, it, it was mind blowing to me that you would ask her, why do you hate them? And she would go on and on gibberish. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the propaganda worked very well. Yeah, and, at that age, I guess, people. Well, that age, and then also knowing the ramifications of all the things that came afterwards. Yeah. Mm. You know, and, 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 and seeing what happened, you know, after the fact, uh, should, should have changed your mind a little bit. Yeah, I, this is what I'm saying. It was just like so bizarre. And her daughter and the man she married <clears throat> felt the same way. Mm -hmm. Which I, they were all born in the United States. Mm -hmm. So I just never understood. I, I don't understand that kind of hatred, anyways, but. No, I don't think anybody yeah. can. I, I, I think you know, we, we re examine this whole thing many times over. And the material that I have before you lived through all of it and has a story to tell. And it still doesn't resonate with some people. I mean, it's amazing. You know, it, it's truly amazing. With all this stuff that's around, with all the museums that are around, I mean, basically they're <sighs> trying to think how many museums are out there right now. I used to know the number at one point in time, but uh, over the last five or so years, the number has pretty much gone absolutely cuckoo. I know Florida has five museums right now, Texas has three. Colorado has two, I mean, besides the big one in D.C. I mean, everyone knows about that, but they're, they're, they're just so many that have opened in the last few years. Um, and there's presently a bill pending before the state legislature here to make Holocaust education a primary focus in, in schools. I don't know if it moves along that much, but it's still out there. You know, get in touch with your local rep and see if they can you know, sign their name to it, help them move along a little bit. Uh, but it's, there's like 17, 18 states it's mandatory in right now that I know of. Uh, Texas just became one just recently. Uh, so, I mean, it's kind of strange. You know, we're, we are 75 odd years out and, you know, we, we still have problems with it, you know. It's such a hard thing for most people to comprehend. I think, I think the numbers get tossed out there. And we, and, we, and we can't, you know, fathom that kind of number, you know, when it comes down to the final sifting point. You know, I always say 60 million, because there were 60 million people killed. More than just the Jews. I mean, you know, if there were six million Jews, and you, you go right down the line, and you start adding up the numbers, and the numbers just don't quite jive, but they do. Uh, 20 million Soviets, uh, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. And, uh, you know, my problem is trying to find all this stuff before it's all gone, and, you know, tossed out because, you know, people are dying and families don't want this stuff. I mean, the story behind this, this thing is it, it, it's unbelievable, the family is throwing it out. This, was, this, this, this whole suit belonged to a family member, and it was pitched out because they didn't want any, any, anything like that around them anymore. Um, but it went deeper. I mean, it went much deeper, and 
in so many areas. Um, book publishing. I mean, magazines, books. This is Rasputin, Tool of the Jew. This is a book here telling how Rasputin brought down the Romanov family. No historical basis on it whatsoever. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just all made up garbage. And, but it goes into quite detailed, you know, format of how Rasputin took advantage and brought about the destruction of the you know, 400-year Romanov. And when this book became known to me, it was going up for auction, I said I had to have it because it's a common book. It's really common. I've seen, you know, I, I was going to buy one in better shape than this with a dust jacket on it for $60. But I had to have it because this thing came out of Hitler's library. Take it out of the Reich Chancellery. This is a, this is a book out of his own personal library. And I hate to tell you, Uh, but I could have one in the dust jacket. A couple of one thing I wonder about, and I don't know if this is something you can really comment on, but the, the history of hating Jews goes back a thousand years. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, and I'm wondering the, how much of this. this oh, the history, history goes into it. The star, the yellow star, the yellow star. All Jews in medieval time had to wear a yellow belt when they walked into towns in Europe. This is going back to the 10th century, the 11th century, the 12th century. This is going way back. So, I mean, it's, and, and the Nazis were keen on this, and they, um, so, yeah. that's where the color yellow comes in. Um, the Nazis were keen on a lot of things. Like the Nuremberg Laws were all based on other laws that were already in Germany in the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. These were laws that they, 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 they had culled through, and they had found these things, and, and, and they, they just readapted to suit their needs. And as I always tell people, especially students, what Hitler did to the Jews in the, in the German mind was legal. The laws were there on the books. They could show the law and say, this is legal. We can do this. We have the legitimacy to do this. And that's, what, and that's how they operated. That's how they totally operated. I mean, by the time you get to the camp set I always tell people this. Hitler was in power for less than 30 days in 1934 after he took over the Reich, after Hindenburg had died. But in 1933, when he came in as the Reich Chancellor, Hindenburg was still alive as president. But within 30 days after he came into power, the first camp opened up and died. And after that, from 1933 to 1945, do you know how many camps and ghettos were around in Nazi Germany? And I'm talking the Greater Reich, not just Germany, but Poland, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, everywhere. Do you, 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 have, you have an idea of how many? Try 39,000. Let that figure sit in. 39,000. You had camps as large as Auschwitz, which covered 20 miles, square miles, and held 40, 40 smaller camps within inside of it. I got some material here from a couple. And then you had all the other little ones all over the place. You had a couple in Berlin, just in Berlin alone, they had a couple of hundred people inside. They were all over the place. And people cannot comprehend that figure. Because we all hear just a few four or five camps, and that's all we ever hear about. But there were thousands, literally thousands, all over the place. There was only you know, you know, six death camps, but you know, the others were all. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask. So the, you, you distinction that they were you're the ones where they were holding places for the camps. Yeah, they were they were holding camps. There were all kinds of camps. I I, I didn't no, I didn't bring the I, I, another item I had at home. It's a grain bag, this big. It has the SS double lightning bolts, bolts at it. It has special rations for a camp called Trebniki. Nobody's ever heard of probably Trebniki. <coughs> Trebniki was in the Lubin district of Poland. 
It was a camp, it was a, really, a beet sugar camp, uh, not beet, a beet sugar factory. That's where the bags came out, basically all beet sugar. And the Nazis just go out there and made the whole thing. But this bag was given to guards who were performing special duty. And of course, in the euphemism of, of the Nazis, special duty meant killing people. Uh, the camp was also a training camp for guards. Uh, the most famous guard who probably graduated from that camp was Demyanyuk, who just recently passed away a couple of years ago and was tried and retried and released. You know, John Demyanyuk. He was, he, was he was a motor worker in Detroit who was actually uh, a, a Soviet Ukrainian prisoner of war who the Nazis twisted around to become a camp guard and he became a vicious camp guard. And uh, so, but. Uh, that was a green bag. I meant to bring that one along, but some of my other houses and things I have, I just can't bring it all. I try to bring a few things that are gonna, you know, resonate with people. But there you, again, you, you just try to imagine all this stuff. And the people that were doing this. And you, and you scratch the back of your heads. Um, here's a fact. Of the five mobile killing squads, which were called the Einsatz squads, after the army went in and took over a region, these guys went in shortly thereafter, and their job was to kill communists, partisans, and Jews, uh, com communist leaders primarily. Of the five top commanders, four of them held double doctorates of law and medicine each. These weren't knuckle-dragging morons. These weren't, you know, people from insane asylums. These were people that were highly educated, highly motivated, who took it upon themselves to, you know, do these horrible tasks of going into a village and taking 20, 30,000 people out at one time. And yet, they had four of them to help both law and medical degrees, doctors. You know what I want to see. Yeah, I'll get to it. Well, hurry up. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the, the thing just, you sit there and you just go crazy trying to think of this. And you go, what same person would do that? You know, guys that went and had doctorates, you know, people that we, we honor, a lawyer, a doctor, would do this. It's crazy. Okay, from my wife. Okay. One of, <laughs> one of the most interesting pieces I have in the collection. I'll pass this around so you get a better look in the case, unfortunately. <clears throat> but it's a simple little green covered. 1941, with the little triangle and the initial DEF, which stands for Deutsches Emol Factory. This is a calendar date book. Unfortunately, it's not built there. I wish it was. And there's a little fold out map of Krakow. But the Deutsches Emol Factory, in the ad in the back here, the Deutsches Emol Factory owner, Oscar Schindler. This is a book that Oscar Schindler. If you ran into him, would reach into his pocket and go, here, here's yours, have it. Call the card, basically. It's a calendar date book, and it has all kinds of cool information in the background, because you know you, you, you need information like the Gestapo phone number for the local Gestapo, the Gestapo president's home phone number. I mean, all, the, all, the, all these phone numbers in the back, you know, just, just, just a list of things that you need to have. Well, I'll pass this around so people can take a look at it. But my wife, my, my wife loves it because <clears throat> I got this out of a Canadian auction several years ago, and nobody wanted it. And where in Krakow is that map? It's Krakow. It's Krakow. It's, 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 it's out of the city. Yeah, the whole city of Krakow. The whole city of Krakow. But uh, what was in the rest of the auction? Medals, decorations. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this this was kind of just. So, I'm like morons. But, uh, <coughs> Can I ask you 
ask you something? Yeah. So, have you archived or inventory? And what are your long term plans, given that you said that Massachusetts doesn't have a. Well, um, I, did have a whole, I did have a Holocaust Museum a few years ago, and this is the uh, Boston Globe article that came out on me several years ago. I did, I did dip my toe into the water. Uh, unfortunately, we lost the space due to. The, the, uh, the people were going to honor the contract, and he decided to give the contract to the food pantry in my hometown. So uh, I'm trying desperately to find a new location. I'm trying to find desperately. To give you a, a quick idea, about 10 years ago, a friend of mine in North Adams, by the name of Ralph Morello, he's an artist, and uh, he has art galleries and stuff, um, found out about my collection. And he had, he had a severe interest in what I had because his father was a dot com. So uh, mention the book. Hmm? Mention the book. Oh yeah, the uh, the book. What's that, what's that book called? I don't know. The big Holocaust yes. book that's out there. It, 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 he, it, he, he was going, he, bought, he bought it at Barnes and Noble. You can buy it for like seven bucks, but it's a big, humongous Holocaust book. He was leafing through it. And he found the Brill family's last uh, seder. And he saw a photograph of his, his father as a boy, his grandfather, his great grandfather, grandmother, aunts and uncles, and all this sort of stuff. They're all gone lost. You know, Ralph took it upon himself to bring two, two groups to my house. The first group was two architects from the, from the architectural firm RAA, Ralph Applebaum, New York. If you mention Ralph Applebaum to anybody in the museum field, they go, them? I had the two top designers who designed the Holocaust Museum at my house. Mm -hmm. uh, they built the World War II Museum in Kansas City. Uh, they built the largest museum in Manitoba, and, now, and they're now building the Lego Museum in Denmark. They spent five and a half hours going through everything. The boxes have been in the drawers, the attic, the cabinets, and the rooms, and the stuff where everything is stored, stacked, and packed. And they said, a 30,000 square foot structure that cost $60 million, and I said to them, fine, uh, I'll just write you the check right now. I'm going to post it 100 years out, and we'll both be fine. I went, what? 60? About uh, a couple weeks later, this other firm from Cambridge, Mass, came out with about four people. They spent about five hours going through the boxes, the bins, the drawers, and everything else. And they said it would take three to four people, two and a half years, to catalog your roughly 10,000 artifacts. 10,000? 10,000. Mm -hmm. More now. Yeah. And would you have approached the uh, Holocaust Museum in DC? Because they're always inviting people to. <laughs> they rank me number five in the country as far as private collectors. Uh -huh. Unless they build a complete wing and dedicate it to me. Uh -huh. And I get it. This is my life. I, I was doing this long before they were even a, e, 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 even a thought. Mm -hmm. They're amazed. They, 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 they have seen stuff. They saw a poster in the, in, in, in the uh, it was down to the Akiva Center, and the director went absolutely bug house when he saw it. Mm -hmm. And then when a uh, professor from the Military Academy of Canada, who is a Ukrainian studies professor, saw this, he said, where in the hell did you get this? And so I got this when I was a boy, about 10 or 11. My dad found this guy in upstate New York and raised chicken, not chicken, but turkeys. And we would get our Christmas, Thanksgiving turkey from this guy every year, a live one. And we would you know, send a butcher out. And when I met him, he was a short man, about this tall, kind of roundish. He spoke a very thick Eastern European accent. Da, da, da. I said, da, da, da. And I asked him, said, leave me alone. Ah, 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 it was in the war, it was in the war. What'd you do? And he snapped to attention. He said, he said, I took partisans, communists, and, you know, that was it. You know, he just, boom. He was like, alive. And of course, this is like the late 60s, early 70s. And in my book, if you're killing communists, it's like, ooh, rah. Uh, so that was about, oh, oh, it went. And then one year we went up. And the son greeted us and said, well, my dad died over the winter, last winter, and uh, I'm selling the farm, and, you know, moving on. You can get your last bird. We got last bird. 
So he went to the house and said, I want to give something to your son. So sandwiched between two pieces of cardboard was this piece of paper about like this and like this. I looked down and went, okay, it's in Russian. So it was all Cyrillic. I didn't know like, how Russian it was. I had no idea what it was. It wasn't until years later when I got it translated that it wasn't Russian, it was Ukrainian. And it said the Jews in this area are to report on such and such a date, at such and such a time, at such and such a place, for such and such a stuff, blah, 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 love and hugs, SS General Katzman. Anybody caught uh, pillaging, uh, all, all the stuff, you know, all the stuff, anybody caught doing this, doing this, doing this, and we shot, 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 shot. Professor Malachuk at the uh, Military University in Ottawa uh, said, if you have this, you have the only known example of it. Whip and I told him the story. He says, that, that, that's a remarkable story. You met a guy who was Einstein. You, got, you, you met a guy who was in the mobile killing squads. That's the only way that guy would have had it. Because the communists would have taken it down. Of course, the Nazis would have taken it down to hide it, too. But that's just part and parcel of all the stuff that's, that's in the collection. Along with this stuff, all this material. I mean, like I said, this is this is the complete sink from this one individual. It has his number tag still attached, and there's some red thread above here indicating he must have been a political prisoner because red was a color for political. But the family had stripped off any of the other numbers in the pocket, and they were throwing this out because they did not want this in the house. They did not want this in the house. Remember, remember that one of the family members was in one of the camps. The shoes, these came from another veteran who I I was gonna I brought the photographs of the camp that he liberated, which was Nordhaus, and I have them blown up. Because that's the only way you can see them, because they're little snapshots. So they're, they're very, but they're a very grotesque set of snapshots because it's a series of snapshots that deal around one individual. And he's a naked skeletonized person. And he's about as big around as my pinky finger. And he's Shooting at him through the barbed wire, and you see them in the compound. And he, the next photograph is walking towards something. There's a garbage pail, it's about like this, this tall. And the next photograph, he's bedding into it to look around for any scraps or anything he could eat. And the next photograph, he's dead on the ground. The last 35 seconds of this guy's life, from the time the camp was liberated, and he took the he took these shoes out of you know north. These are the shoes that were, you can see photographs of the prisoners actually wearing these type of shoes. The bowl here is from Adonik, one of my uh, contacts in Europe. Uh, found a family that had 30 of these things in the house, because after the camp was taken down and everything else, they went into the camp and took these bowls to take them home to use them in their chicken house and everything else. But this, was, this, this is a bowl that's taken from the camp of Adonik. This is a real sinister piece. And okay, close back on. It's a medical book. Common everyday medical book that would have been found at any desk at any position during this time throughout the world. This is the case that came in. Labeled. The morphology. Taking my German on. Professor Werner Koch. Uh, pathological morphology. And it, it just shows all kinds of diseases and everything that you need to know. It's on a full color. But it's from where it's stamped on the inside, on the back. Concentration comp Schlager Auschwitz, Auschwitz Concentration Camp Schlager, Building Block 10, the Medical Experimental Laboratory. This is from. So, technically, possibly housed within here are the fingerprints of Joseph Mengele. Where did I get this? One of my contacts in Poland. Who got it from a family whose family went into Auschwitz after it was liberated and the stuff is lying around the place and it's there. But I have it here.
But this is the stuff that I've been having, and like I said, if Massachusetts wants to have Holocaust study program, I have the ability to set up a complete educational center with artifacts and stuff there. What I would love to find is a school uh, to basically do what has done has been done in the Bronx High School of Science in Bronx, New York. It's been there for now about 40 years. It started much the same as what I had. It started with a teacher who was a collector. He has now since passed. Uh, the museum has gone through many upgrades and it is probably the most visited high school in America. As church, school groups go, go in there all the time to take a look at the collection that's there. Like I said, this is just, I mean, uh, here's a piece that was done by an inmate after liberation from Dachau. He had carved a watch clock. So you can take a look at this. It's, actually it's not going to get damaged in any way, shape, or form. But if you want to take a look at it, he carved it from probably aluminum left around the area. And uh, he dated 1946, which meant that he was still at the camp in 1946 after the liberation, which a lot of prisoners were. But uh, he made a watch bob and did a little artistical work on it. <laughs> but this is all the stuff that I, I hunt down. Um, this is a uniform by SS personnel inside the camp. This is a duty uniform that he would have worn inside the camp. And he was at Dachau. This is the early Dachau uh, emblem for Dachau. A letter from Auschwitz, a letter from uh, Ravensbrück. Um, interesting divorce decree from a... Uh, Polish gentleman in the government, uh, government general of Krakow. I have a lot of Krakow stuff. So I a lot of Krakow seems to be big. But anyways, he's divorcing his Jewish wife because he's Polish, and it'd be much more easier for him to live as a Pole in Poland without his Jewish wife. Obviously, she must have wound up. Do you want a picture of you holding it? Oh. <laughs> she must have wound up in a camp shortly after the divorce. I'm, I'm not sure of that, you know, but it, it doesn't state any of that. Uh, Thank you. This is an interesting little item here. This is made at Auschwitz at, uh, by the IG Farben Company. Uh, it's a chemical called Sarah. But this was for farm use. This is for killing insects and stuff in the field. And it was made under the auspices of our lovely friends at Bear. Who also invented heroin. Huh? Who also invented heroin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who, who's, who's never been prosecuted for their, their crimes that they committed. And all, you know, they, they, they got completely scot free. But it was made under the auspices of IG Farben, which was the main chemical company that made Zyklon B. So it was slave labor, and huh? it was, they were using slave labor. Oh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, slave labor. Yeah, it, it says right here in, in German completely gift. Gift is poison in German. Uh, but this is this was made by, 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 by them, uh, slave labor, in, in one of the 40 sub camps at Auschwitz. You know, they made Buna, which was uh, synthetic rubber. They were trying to uh, use uh, shale to make petrol. I mean, they had all these 40 sub camps lying around Auschwitz that were making product for the war effort. Um, this is probably one of the more darker pieces I own. This is the white summer tunic worn by the last commandant, Kurt Franz of Treblinka. This is his actual tunic. These are his actual shoulder boards, SK, Sondo Command, T for Tribolinka. He would have worn this uh, around the camps during the summer months that he was there. And uh, the, board, the other boards in there are from his counterpart, <laughs> Dachau. Um, what else is there? Interesting. Oh, yes, the protocol. This is the this protocol. It says Geheim at the top. And this was on. Um, most of the commandant's desks at that time, because it says, your commandant, and he's supposed to sign off. 
and the hour in which the execution started and the hour in which it stopped. These were filled out by the commandant of who was going to get shot that day. How many people were going to get, you know, just taken out randomly out of, out, out of the uh, roll call line to be taken out and shot. And this was the paperwork that they had to fill out. And uh, this is blank. 